Okay, good to be back in the house of God, amen. Good to be back in the Word of God, amen. I've, uh, we enjoyed our time uh, of relaxation and creation. It was nice, but it's good to be back home, amen. amen. It's good to be in the place where God wants you, amen. And it's a lot cheaper to be here than it is to be in other places. Uh, okay, we won't go into that. Anyway, so we've been continuing our study of the book of Jude, which I have really enjoyed and hope you have too. And it's an important book because it's just right before the book of Revelation. And it's almost like the last chance God is saying to the world, wake up, the worst is coming. And I was talking to a, a Christian yesterday when I was down there, and, and he was an amillennialist. And uh, yeah, he was a Christian, he was saved. He said, well, you know what, we're, we're, things are getting better. And I said to him, what planet are you living on? Things are not getting better. Things are getting worse. And uh, Ross uh, sent me a, a video of some guy who claims to be a technological prophet. If you like, afterwards, I'll, I'll send you the link of it. And he was talking about artificial intelligence and how that technology is going to be the next God. And that all the new religions are going to come out of uh, California and uh, India and places like that, all about technology. And it was interesting some of the things he was saying. He was saying that God is not a very good God because all he did was, it was create organic things. But technology is going to mar the organic with the technological and make gods, this is what he said, gods out of human beings. Think about that for a second. And he talked about how that in a few years there's going to be entities walking around us. I've got news for him. It's already here. It's already here, amen. So it's interesting that, you know, the Bible and the book of Jude, and, and I, I was talking to someone yesterday about this, the book of Jude was written by Jude, who used parchment paper probably, and some kind of ink, it might have been uh, from uh, an octopus or something like that. And yet 2,000 years later, we have the technology that we have today, and they're talking about re-engineering human beings, hacking human beings to be greater than what we are, or more importantly, what God made us. And that's where we get into the book of Jude. Because the book of Jude, as we saw in the last few weeks, is all about those who have turned their back upon God, those who have rejected God, and those who are trying to replace themselves as God. And this is a pathway that the world is going down. And remember the Lord Jesus Christ said that the broad way leads to destruction and many there be that find that way. But the narrow way leads unto life. And that narrow way is, in the, is, is faith in the death, burial of the Lord Jesus Christ and putting your faith and trust in him and not your own works or merit or trying to be God yourself. Amen. So we're going to see how this goes down the road. Have you ever gone down the road sometimes and you're going the wrong way and you have to come to that place where you say, I need to turn around? Some people are just stubborn and they keep going anyway and hope they eventually find the right way. But a smart thing, like for instance this morning, I, I, I did a Bruce. I must say, I did a Bruce. I was coming, no, not that. I, I was coming to church and I was having a cup of coffee and I, I, it's one of these cup of coffees and I thought, it, yes, exactly, and I thought it was okay so I drank a cup of coffee and it was really good and I looked down and my shirt and tie were brown from the coffee stains. So I had to, Debbie says, well, it's okay, you can just bluff your way, nobody will see you up the front. I said, no, no, I've got to go back. <laughs> it was all over, it was all brown. I said, the tie's not that, I can't hide it. It was a brown tie, so it wasn't so bad. So I had to turn around and change. Now, I believe everything happens for a reason. And I think God was saying to me, that's a good point in the message today. There are points in your life when you can turn around and make a change. Amen. Now, call that what you like, but I call it God's purpose in our lives. God knows what's going on. And I think one of the wonderful things about God is he gives us many opportunities to make U-turns. Amen. And a U-turn means that you turn. God doesn't turn, you turn. But for these people we're going to see this morning in this passage of scripture, they're not interested in turning. They're going down the pathway they're going to. So look at verse number 11 of this. 
It says, first of all, woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Korah. So you have three different individuals here. You have Cain, you have Balaam, and you have Korah. And these are indicative or illustrative of the kinds of people we find today. And the devil hasn't changed. If it works, it works. And the devil keeps doing the same things. So there are three things that the devil used in this pathway of, of sin. And first of all is the apostasy and the way of Cain. Now who was Cain? Cain was the first person born in this planet. He was born after Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve, but Adam and Eve. And he was born here and he saw and was told about what God did for Adam and Eve in providing a lamb as a sacrifice. Because God had to clothe them with animal skin. So an animal had to die so that they could be clothed. And in the process of time, there was also Cain and there was Abel. And they both knew they needed to bring an offering to God. Abel took the offering of the shed blood. But Cain, who was obviously a very religious man, decided, I will do it my way, not God's way. And that's still going on today, amen? The way of Cain, salvation by the works and the religion of man. Cain was a religious man. He went and he, he offered to God, he gave what God, he thought was wanted, but he wanted to do it his way. The first thing I want to note this morning about Cain is that he was unteachable. You ever met someone like that, relative? You tell them, well, here's, here's what the simple, plain word of God says. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy has saved us. Plain, simple scripture. All have sinned and come short. Well, that's not me. I, 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 you're not saying I'm a sinner listen I told the now king King Charles who was then Prince Charles he was a sinner and Amen. needed a savior Amen. everyone needs a savior right. because we're all sinners yeah. and he especially is a uh, uh, but you know so he was unteachable it didn't matter what Adam and Eve told him or the Abel told him he decided to do it his way now an interesting thing about this he became the father of all false religion that's based upon man and his works and his merits and the religion of Cain is all around us people try are you going to heaven well I hope so if I'm good enough where in the Bible do you find that anyone in the Old Testament or the New Testament was good enough to go to heaven nobody worked their way to heaven in the Old Testament nobody worked their way to heaven in the New, in the New Testament there's only one way to heaven and that's faith in the Lord Jesus Christ Amen. that's it one door one way one door that's it well I'm going a different door well that's just your interpretation simple there is no private interpretation the religion of Cain interesting and here's a good point Cain was not willing to slay a lamb for his sins but he was willing to slay his brother because his brother did the right thing that's false religion that's why christians down through the ages who have been murdered and persecuted by false religion doesn't matter if it's the roman catholic church in the dark ages or the protestant church amen protestants kill baptists too christians too they burned them at the stake i was playing golf with a, with a guy i knew who was a free presbyterian preacher from northern ireland and we played golf many years ago and you know how you get into conversations and and i said to my steve i said steve and we talked about this guy um back in the um 1600s uh servetus who was who was burned at the stake by john calvin because he believed differently than John Calvin, he believed in salvation by faith and all the rest of that. And uh, I said to him, Steve, you know, if we were both alive at that time, you'd be burning me at the stake too, because I believe what Servetus believed. He says, well, not necessarily. Well, that's comforting. Not necessarily, <laughs> but possibly, <laughs> not necessarily. <laughs> There's an option. And he was saying like, well, because we're friends, I would make sure it didn't happen to you, but if we were any friends, that's false religion. You see, false religion has no toleration of true religion. It was the same back in the, in, in, in the book of Genesis. It was the same in the, in the dark ages. It's the same today. 
If you believe this book, false religion has no toleration for you. If you don't believe this book, it will tolerate you just fine. That was Cain. He was the father of all false religion. What made the difference between Cain and Abel was faith. Abel, by faith, offered a sacrifice. You say, how did I know that? Glad you asked. Let's turn over to uh, 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 Hebrews chapter 11. Just a couple of pages back. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 4. You know, I love Hebrews chapter 11. It's a great chapter. If you've never read it, I, I suggest you do. And please, if you can, this is the salvation by faith chapter in the book of the Bible. If you find the salvation by works chapter, please let me know. <laughs> Because in, in, in more than 40 years of being a Christian, I've searched the scriptures and I can't find it. But I find Hebrews 11 by faith, by faith, yeah. by faith, Amen. nothing by words. But look at verse number four. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. So by faith, he was made righteous. Yeah. Old Testament. And if you go through the rest of it, you'll find the same thing. And uh, that was how, that what made the difference. He was saved by faith, but Cain, who was not teachable, said, no, I'm doing it my way. But there's another person here, a guy called Balaam. Now, if you go over to, we won't go there today, but if you read in number 16, you'll find about Balaam, and you'll find the things that he did. First of all, you'll find that a donkey talked. This is probably not the most spiritual thing to say, but sometimes God uses donkeys to talk to us. <laughs> it took a donkey to talk to Balaam for him to listen. He wasn't listening to God, so God used a donkey. <laughs> what was Balaam all about? Well, Balaam was what we would call today a witch. He was a psychic. He was one who pretended to not have an inroad to God for money. How do I know that? Well, the Bible tells me. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 15 says this: which are forsaking the right way and gone and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Besor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. Now let me say this morning: a lot of people get wrong. They say that the money is a root of all evil. That's not what the Bible says. It says the love of money is a root of all evil. There's nothing wrong with money. Amen. You can use it for the glory of God. They used it to dedicate the temple. They used it for things of God. You can use it to get missions out. You can use it to buy Bibles and tracts and do all kinds of things. But Balaam loved money. And there are many people today just like that. Jude chapter 1, we, we saw that. It says, Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the er error of Balaam for reward. Religion for sale, all over the place. We went to Spain a few years ago, and we went to this little, this dinky wee place on a hill. And we went inside, it must have been about 10 feet by 12 feet. And inside was full of all kinds of idols and gold and silver, and they're all worshiping it. You know what Paul said? Silver and gold, have I none? Amen. Now, I'm not against silver and gold. There's nothing wrong with it. <coughs> but this is not a ballot. He was all about religion for reward. And that's what goes on today. Here's an interesting verse from Revelation chapter 2, verse 14. The Lord Jesus Christ says to one of the churches there, But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, <coughs> who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. Well, if you read in the Old Testament, Balaam had this idea. He couldn't curse Israel. So he tried to make them compromise in their standards and in their righteousness. He tried to pollute the children of God with the children of the devil. Amen. There are many people to say, yes, you're saved, but you don't have to live a godly life. You don't have to live a holy life. You don't have to live a righteous life. <coughs> In fact, just live any life you like. As long as you're saved, you're going to heaven. That's all you need to care about. 
They read that verse in John chapter 8 when Jesus said to the woman taken in adultery, go and sin more instead of go and sin no more. That doesn't mean the child of God will never sin anymore, but that sin is not the priority in our lives. It's not the thing like the world gives itself to. Money, sin, power, prestige. It's not the things we want in life, but as we sang this, mo this morning, more about Jesus, would I know? More of his love to others, sure. More of his kingdom, sure, increase. More about Jesus. That's a priority. And what Balaam did, he tried to lead to compromise, leading to defilement. <coughs> How many Christians have you met and I met that you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between them and the world? How many Christians have I met who say they're born again, they're saved, and yet they'll curse the same way everybody else curses? They'll live, they'll speak, they'll listen to the same music. They'll do the same things. And, oh, I'm a child of God. That's the doctrine of Balaam. Trying to mix the righteous with the unrighteous. Yeah. Now, when you mix things together, sometimes you can make good things. Like if you get cake ingredients and you mix them all together and put them in the oven and, and after a while you put the frosting on, it's all good. But if I take those cake ingredients and I take something putrid and horrible and put in it, it doesn't matter how it smells, it's been polluted. And God wants us not to be a polluted people. And the doctrine of Balaam was all about loving the wages of unrighteousness and defiling that which God separates to be holy. Yeah. We're supposed to be different. Mm -hmm. Now, that, I did say we're supposed to be perfect. Amen. None of us are perfect. None of us are what we should be. Yeah. But it's the direction of travel in which we're going. Yeah. Are we going into the world or are we going out of the world are we being more like Jesus or are we being more like the devil amen yeah. and then not only that we see in, in verse number 11 woe to them for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran and ran greedily after the order of Balaam for reward and perished in the gain saying of Korah who is Korah well if you look in Numbers chapter 16 you'll find the rebellion of Korah See, Korah was a man who was discontent with what God gave him. He was part of the Levitical family, so he had a place and a position that God could use in service, but he went and decided he was going to attack and destroy the man of God. I believe we live in a day and a time in which people don't want shepherds to shepherd the sheep. They want to be shepherdless. Now, if you've ever watched sheep for any amount of time, after they gather together and they feed and they eat, they'll also get themselves into a lot of trouble. Sheep, if, if, if one sheep walks off the cliff, the other sheep will follow. That's why sheep need a shepherd. Amen. And the whole part about the, the, the gainsaying of Korah, as he was saying, Moses, who do you think you are? All God's people are righteous. But yet God had put Moses in the place of leadership. Mm -hmm. And God puts people in the places of leadership in our lives. And when we get our eyes off of Christ, oftentimes we get, you know, we're not honest enough, I'm talking generally, to say to God, God, I don't like what you're doing with me. I don't like what you've given me. I don't like my position in life. But let's go and tag that preacher. <laughs> Who does he think he is telling me the Bible? He's preaching about, well, that preacher's, he, 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 he. That's the gay saying of Korah. You see, if God has given a message to the man of God, God has given it so that you can be fed. Amen. They were against Moses because Moses, they thought in their sinful way, exalted himself higher than he should have been and yet the Bible says of Moses he was a humble man he was a man who didn't think much of himself you see Korah's pride was a sin of pride and there's nothing in the Bible that says anything good about pride no matter how many months you want to give to it 
Pride leads to destruction, the Bible tells us. The Bible says God blesses the humble and rejects the arrogant. Turn over to James chapter 4 for a second. James chapter 4 <coughs> and verse number 6. This is an interesting verse for the month in which we are in. So called. James chapter 4 verse 6 says, But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace in the humble. You want more grace in your life? Be humble. You want more grace in your life? Be content. Paul said godliness with contentment is great gain. Yeah. I've often said, and I'll say it again, one of the great joys in the Christian life is to find the will of God for yourself yeah. and be happy with it. Yeah. Amen. Well, I know what God's will for me is, but I want better. <laughs> well, maybe God knows you. <laughs> and decides this is the right thing for you. And Korah thought himself, well, I can be higher than Moses. I can do more. He was disconsent and he was proud. God put Moses there for a reason. And there's a <clears throat> group of people today who don't want any leadership in their life. They don't want any shepherd in their life. They just want to do their own thing. And if you're doing God's thing, that's fine. But how often do we do the wrong thing? What does the Bible say? Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 15. And I will give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. I like that verse. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11 and 12. And he gave some, pa uh, some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 3, 5. Who then is Paul and who is Apollos but ministers by whom you believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? You see, the devil can't do anything about your salvation when you're saved. You're saved forever. Amen. Amen. But he can lead you off into dark, dangerous places yeah. where you're not as useful for service as God would like you to be. Ever been down those roads? You ever been in that dark place by yourself? Don't you wish you had someone with a shepherd's crook who could just whoosh, get you out of there? Yeah. That's why God gave pastors mm -hmm. and teachers. Right. Amen. Mm -hmm. The devil wants Christians to wander and not be under solid, scriptural, sensible, Holy Ghost preaching of God's word. Amen. That's what the devil wants. Yeah. But the Bible says faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word. Mm -hmm. But if you're not here, H-E-R-E, -E, yeah. you cannot here, H-E-A-R. Amen? Amen? You've got to be here to hear. What did Jesus say? He who hath an ear to hear, let him hear. It's very simple and profound. If God gives messages to pastors to preach, it's for you to be here so you can hear. Amen? If, can you imagine, for instance, if, if, if someone in your family, your mother, your wife, or whatever, made a huge meal, maybe some ribs and some steak and all the trimmings and went through all the bother and all the rest of it and said, okay, it's time for dinner. And you said, nah, I don't feel like it today. <laughs> I spent all this time preparing this and making this and you're not. If you've got any sense, you'll sit down and eat, amen. <laughs> and the same is true spiritually. If God gives messages to the man of God, then maybe he wants you to hear it. Yeah. But you cannot hear it unless you are here. Yeah. And see, that's the whole thing of Korah. Korah was, no, 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 I'll do my thing. I'm discontent with following what God says and God's way of leadership, so I'll do my thing. And if you read what happened in Numbers chapter 16, he perished and the ground opened up and swallowed him. That's the kind of thing that's going on today. That's what's going on. Now, we're going to see the description of these people in verse number 12. These are spots in your feasts 
of charity. Now, I like the way they did it in the New Testament. <clears throat> when they met together, they had feasts of charity, love feasts. Everybody brought something to eat, and everybody had a, a, a lot to eat. Amen. Amen. But it says these leaders came along and brought spots. Now, being a guy, I don't notice things that my, things that my wife notices all the time. Like, for instance, if I have a tie on and it has a spot, like this morning, I, d I don't, don't know it. <laughs> but she'll be, aha, dee -dee 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 -dee. right, that's got a spot in it. You'll have to do some of that. She gets her, and does all that. But these people are spots in the feast. Now, it used to be in the, the old days, before technology and all the rest of it, the way you could detect a crack or the way you could look at a spot is you would take your cloth or you would take your item, such as a vase or something like that, and the way to inspect it was to hold it up to the sun, and the sun would reveal the spots and the cracks. And the same is true of religious leaders today who claim to be prophets, apostles, ministers, faith healers. When you hold them up to the sun, the spots are evident. Spots can be difficult to clean. They can be something that can bring infection. They can bring disease. And these people coming in, they were spots. They were just the kind of people who, who ruined everything. He says they are spots in your feast of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. In other words, they have no fear of God. This is going to do what they want. I like what this says. Clouds they are without water. You see, in the Old Testament, a cloud was, a, was, was, was it, when God sent clouds into the land, it meant rain was coming and God was going to bless. The clouds. Amen. We don't have any problem. I remember years ago we were in Spain and, and we were in a prayer meeting in, in, um, in a church there. We went to church there and, and they were praying. And one of the prayer requests, requests was they were praying for rain. And I put my hand up and I said, we never pray that prayer request in Scotland. We pray for the rain to stop, not for the rain to start. No problem with the rain. But these are clouds without water. In other words, they look like the real thing, but they were a scam. They were a fake. They were not the real deal. And there are many religious leaders and Christians today, or so-called Christians, who look like the real thing, but they don't have God in their life. They get up, and I've seen them with the dog collars and the robes and all the rest of it, and they, 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 they flow around and do all this kind of stuff. But God is not a million miles from them. Amen. Clouds without water. Amen. They're not the real thing. This is the characteristic of the age. These false, te these false teachers present themselves as clouds. They came as people sent from God to bring salvation, healing, freedom, deliverance for cash. <laughs> But they're not the real deal. They are clouds without water. They were not what they said they were going to do. The Bible says they have a form of godliness, but denying the th power thereof. Interesting, I was thinking about this, about the clouds. And we talk, think of clouds in the, the sky and all the rest of it. But you ever think about clouds that are going on today, the Microsoft cloud, the Google cloud, all the information. The Bible talks about the image of the beast and the in the book of Revelation, clouds without water. <laughs> How much information things is going to be going in clouds today? But I think specifically clouds without water is a mention of the prosperity gospel of today. The prosperity gospel that says if you're, if you're right with God, you'll always be healthy, you'll always be wealthy, and all that. Can, it's, it's all about feeling good and, and, and just down the road and jumping up and down and, and, and all that kind of nonsense. <laughs> prosperity gospel. They are clouds without water. It speaks to me of people like Benny Hinn, Joseph Prince, Credo Dollar, and all the rest of them. Clouds without water. They claim to be many things, but they are not. Clouds they are without water. Carried about when trees whose fruit withereth without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the root. I tell you, that's a bad plant. The roots are withered, the fruit is withered, they're twice dead and they're plucked up by the roots. Not much of a plant, amen. But remember, Jesus said, by their fruits. 
you shall know them by their fruits. These people who claimed to be religious leaders like Korah, they, they were clouds without water, they had no fear, their fruit withereth. In other words, there was no fruit there. It was useless. They were without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. You know, the Bible says that the Lord Jesus Christ comes, that he will pluck up the plants that are no good. Remember the Lord Jesus Christ cursed the plant going into Jerusalem because it had no fruit. The Lord Jesus Christ was angry with the religious more than anyone else because it was the religious leaders who were deceiving and leading people to hell. And that's what's going on today. The world is saying, let's begin together and come together and have a one world religion, a one world government. And let's all get together and sing whatever you want to sing. And we'll all be happy. And let's get those fundamentalists, those Bible-believing Christians. They're the problem. Going back to Cain. Cain had a problem with offering blood, but no problem in killing his brother. And the religion of today has a real problem with the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why many preachers today are talking, oh, you don't need the blood. Oh, no, you don't need the blood. It doesn't matter about the blood. It just matters about the death. It's the death, burial of the Lord Jesus Christ as he shed his blood Amen. to pay for our sins. Right. On the altar, yeah. the blood and the labor didn't go, do any good whatsoever. Yeah. It had to be offered. Yeah. And that's why the Lord Jesus Christ said, touch me not for I'm not yet ascended. Because yeah. he was going to offer the blood on the altar. It's in heaven. That's the standard and the state of religion today just before the book of Revelation. Now this was written in the first century by a guy with papyrus and a quill and God told him this is what it's going to be. And I'm sure Jude when he wrote, wrote this said wow that's pretty bad. Glad I'm no life in that. But we are. What should be our response to this time in which we live? First of all I believe draw closer to the Lord. Amen. 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 The Bible says, draw closer to him, he will draw closer to you. First of all, and, and, and learn more about the Lord Jesus Christ. Hold his word more in your heart than the words of any yeah. religious leader. That's right. I think it's true, amen. Don't believe what I say just because I say it. Amen. Check it for yourself, amen. amen. Check it for yourself. Amen. And look up. The Lord's coming back soon. Amen. Amen. I'm not looking for this world to get better. <laughs> I'm not looking for this world to improve. I'm not looking for the latest this, this, that, and the other. I'm looking for the one who's taken us out. Amen. The world's talking about technology and artificial intelligence and how you can be your own God and you can be better than what God made you because you can be organic and technological. I'm not looking for that. I'm not looking for any government to make our lives better. Amen. They're all corrupt. That's right. I'm looking for the Lord. Yeah. And if we look for him and we follow him, will follow the right path and not the path of these false prophets, religious leaders. Book of Jude's an amazing book. And it's only going to get better. But we're going to see at the end, we can encourage ourselves, we can build up ourselves, and we can be like a tower, a castle. I like one of the things they do in Scotland, they have keeps. You know what a keep is? You run into a keep to keep yourself alive. And that's what the Word of God is. It's a keep. You're safe in the Word of God, not in anything else. Let's pray. Dear Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for the study of Jude. We've been looking at the, de the, the desperate and the despicable times in which we live. But Lord, we thank you that you are even more lovely in the, in, the, in the darkness in which the light shines. So Father, we pray you bless us. Work to our hearts. Help us to be a people of righteousness, a people of your word, a people who will follow you in, even in this dark times. We ask these things and commit them unto you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's take our song book.